Hello, everyone, and welcome to Coffee with Kalefi. My name is Max Rohr, and I'm going to be uh, introducing our host today. So this is a really big topic for us. We had a lot of registrations for this uh, topic, Hydronics in, for Low Energy and Net Zero Buildings by John Siegenthaler. He's going to be our presenter. So what I'll do is go through a couple of the introduction slides, and I'll turn it over to John. This will be a 90-minute webinar, um, and on the uh, here's the information if you're having issues with GoToWebinar. Usually the best idea is just to log out and log back in, but uh, if you are looking for additional support, there's the tech support directly to GoToWebinar. Uh, you can get a copy of the presentation if you push uh, the button for yes in the post-webinar survey, and then we archive everything on YouTube as well. Then on the next slide, uh, since this is a 90-minute webinar, uh, the PDH uh, continuing education certificate that we send you that uh, you'll have to verify with your state or province if that'll work is going to be 1.5 PDHs since it's a 90-minute. And then we are excited. We've had a really good run with the AHR Innovation Awards series. Uh, they do awards for product every year for the trade show. Uh, they have a new category for sustainability as of 2022. And we were one of three finalists with the uh, DHW control system. So based on water savings and energy savings to use uh, a really state-of-the-art uh, thermal disinfection or just standard uh, DHW mixing and research system, uh, they thought this was one of the three best products of the whole show. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we had been a, a finalist previously, previously just for the Legio mix by itself, but the whole system, they were excited about that. Then uh, Hydronix 30 is out now digitally and we'll be shipping these shortly. Uh, Hydronix for low energy and net zero buildings, which is the topic of the presentation today. So on the next slide, there is, uh, you can get this as a PDF uh, from our website. You can also go to hydronix.kalefi.com. And this is more of an interactive version than just a, a static PDF that you can view from your computer or from your phone. And um, we can also add additional resources like uh, the topic uh, of I-30, Hydronics 30, we were able to add uh, this old house video that John Siegenthaler was uh, involved with uh, as part of one of the kind of additional resources for the, the topic. So that's something that's a little different than just the PDF. And then next, I will turn it over to our guest host, John Siegenthaler, uh, and he's going to go over this topic in the, the next 90 minutes. Take it away, John. Well, thanks, Max. And uh... Uh, welcome to the Coffee with Kalefi, folks. Uh, this is a topic that I've wanted to do for quite a while. How do we bring the benefits of hydronics and, and the superior comfort and energy efficiency that it offers? How do we merge that with this growing trend towards net zero buildings? And it turns out there's quite a few uh, benefits to bringing these two technologies together. And we're going to kind of dissect that as we go through today. So. We're going to start off with uh, just briefly what's happening with the energy markets, not only in North America, but globally. Uh, electrification is a, a major uh, increase in the market right now uh, versus fossil fuels. This is definitely going to have a bearing on how the hydronics market changes as we go forward. It's a great opportunity. Um, we're also going to talk about you know, what I call poor, poor perceptions of hydronic system. Why haven't hydronic systems become kind of the default in this net zero market? Well, the perception is complexity, cost, and so forth, and it really doesn't have to be that way. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, what's changing in residential construction? Uh, a lot of things are changing. Codes are changing, uh, consumer preferences are changing. Uh, certainly, the, the loads that we deal with, the space hitting loads, are roughly a third of what they were perhaps 30 or 40 years ago. And to, to remain relevant, the hydronics industry needs to recognize these changes and adapt to them. We're going to talk a bit about, again, the difference between comfort and thermodynamics. It's pretty easy to satisfy the thermodynamic requirement of heating a space. Basically, you, you match the heat loss with the heat input and you've satisfied the thermodynamics. But that doesn't mean you've satisfied human physiological comfort requirements. So we're going to look at the difference. Why should we use hydronics? What, what benefits do hydronics bring into this market? And one of the technologies that we're going to be talking about, 
And we have talked about this in past uh, Coffee with Galefi sessions, as well as past issues of hydronics, uh, is the air to water heat pump. Uh, it's not necessarily the only heat source that we can use in a net zero project, but it is a good one. And that market is growing rapidly, uh, both globally, and we're starting to see quite a bit of traction in the North American market. So we're also gonna look at retrofitting. Many of the houses that are out there now that have fossil fuel heating systems, they are candidates to get an air to water heat pump. How do we pipe that in? How do we control that? And then as we wrap up the session, we'll be looking at some example systems. You'll see one schematic up there. Uh, we're gonna take that apart in a little bit more detail. So you'll kind of see how do you put the parts and pieces together to build some of these systems? So electrification, um, this is, you know, you'd really have to kind of bury yourself if you're in the energy field today, you'd have to bury yourself under a, a rock not to see what's happening with electricity, uh, again, both globally and in North America. I'm sure probably everybody that's tuned in today has driven by a large utility scale solar photovoltaic field, or perhaps you've seen some wind turbines, utility scale electricity generation. And back a couple of years ago during 2020, uh, renewable energy, renewable electricity accounted for about 75% of that new electrical generating capacity within the United States. And then you see a graph up there. Um, this is from the Energy Information uh, Association. And you can see electricity is starting to kind of pull away there from the other fuels as we go forward. So we're going to be dealing with this. This is uh, you know, this is simply a change in the global energy market. And again, uh, there's certainly politics involved in this. And I try to uh, suggest to people, don't get too uh, riled up about the politics. Look at this as a tremendous opportunity going forward. And I'll try to build the case for why I say that as we go through. Um, one of the publications, it's, it's free. I put a link to it over here on the right side that I'd recommend you take a look at is uh, this advancing towards 100%. And this is, is not really, a, you know, it's not a political piece. Uh, it's not an agenda piece. It's basically a summary of what states are doing uh, for uh, moving towards renewable electricity. And you, you'll see I've highlighted the word electricity in here. Uh, it is pervasive throughout these state energy plans. Uh, and many states, uh, I'm, I'm from New York, uh, have some pretty ambitious goals, 100% renewable electricity by 2040. And again, the operative word here is electricity. And how, again, is that going to affect the hydronics market? Another thing that is happening is moratoriums on fossil fuels. These are occurring rapidly. Within the last year, several major cities, and, and I put a list down here of at least some of the major ones. Uh, for example, New York City back in December, uh, they passed a resolution in their city council. I believe it kicks in in January of next year. Any buildings under six stories cannot, any new construction under six stories cannot use fossil fuels. Uh, again, I, I don't really, I'm gonna remain neutral on the politics behind that, but it's reality. and. As heating and cooling professionals, we have an opportunity to deal with that. Um, so again, a major shift towards electricity. And also the net zero market. Um, you, can, you can find quite a bit of information online about growth in different states as well as different provinces and, and globally. But the net zero market as a niche within the overall construction market, it's one of the fastest growing segments. Uh, this map that I've got up here shows, uh, un, you know, not surprisingly, California is by far leading in the United States as far as uh, adopting regulations that will essentially force net zero construction in the near future. But we're, we're looking at, again, a major growth opportunity, both in residential and commercial structures. Uh, how do we bring hydronics in and avail ourselves of what's happening with this market? Now, poor perceptions of hydronic heating. 
here's an interesting schematic. And you know, this was not drawn with AutoCAD or Photoshop. This goes back to pen and ink, probably around 1900. It's a what we refer to as a gravity hot water heating system. Uh, no circulators were used because they hadn't been really invented yet. Uh, this is all before electricity. So we're looking at cast iron radiators, sloping piping, and a system that only relied on the buoyancy of hot water you know, relative to the uh, lower buoyancy of cooler water as the means of propulsion. Uh, these were open systems. You see an expansion tank up here in the upper right with an overflow pipe on it. And these worked. Uh, they, the engineers at the time used what tools and what knowledge they had available to make these systems work. So the question is, how do we go from something like this, relatively simple, to something like these photos show? Um, over the years that, that I've worked in this industry, I've seen hundreds of photos like this of uh, what we would consider, uh, even as heating professionals, uh, pretty complicated systems, a lot of controls, a lot of wiring, walls full of circulators, and so forth. And to some degree, the hydronics industry has kind of shot itself in the foot by showing these types of systems as representative of what modern hydronics is or what it could be. And imagine yourself as a, as a typical consumer and you're looking at some of these photos and, and probably thinking, well, that looks very complicated. It looks like it probably will break at some point in the future. When it breaks, who's going to fix it? It also looks expensive. Uh, can't you do this with something simpler? And I'm sure uh, many opportunities to install hydronic-based systems have been lost because of perceptions generated from this type of uh, uh, photo. And again, my contention is this is not the future of hydronics. We aren't going to just add more circulators to the wall or just change from standard permanent split capacitor motor circulators to ECM-based circulators. Now, that, that is a step in the right direction, but we need to simplify. We need to create simple, uh, simple systems that are repeatable and serviceable. Okay, so here's a uh, photo. I believe this is a, uh, a control room in probably back in the 1950s at a power plant. So do you see any similarities? Well, uh, you know, black and white versus color, right? Uh, again, walls full of controls, even though those controls are good products, and I'm sure those systems do function, imagine yourself as an HVAC tech and you walk into this and you're asked to troubleshoot it. Where do you start? Hopefully somebody wrote down a sequence of operation for that system. So we're going to look at simple systems. Um, this is a system that uses a, uh, an actual air to water heat pump, what's called a split system air to water heat pump. Uh, it has a buffer tank in it. That tank serves two purposes. It buffers the space heating load and it also serves as a preheat tank for domestic hot water. Uh, the space heating distribution system is very simple. It uses panel radiators with non-electric thermostatic valves. Uh, Half-inch PEX tubing goes out and back to each radiator. We call that a home run distribution system. And uh, you can have room by room zoning, um, domestic hot water heater. And if you look down near the bottom, you'll see a, a chill water air handler. Uh, so during summer, that heat pump is gonna produce chill water circulated through that air handler. And we're gonna have whole house cooling. So we're, we're really putting multiple loads together into a single system. Uh, it's certainly good from an installer standpoint. You don't have multiple contractors on the job, one contractor responsible for heating, one contractor responsible for cooling, and so forth. And it, it certainly increases profit margin potential for those that install these systems. Now, <clears throat> we need to adapt our approaches in hydronic heating and cooling to what is happening with buildings. Okay, so let's take a look at it. Um, certainly energy codes and energy prices are changing the construction market and the changes are happening rapidly. Every two to three years, some of the major codes are being updated and typically the energy aspects of those codes are tightening the envelope of the building. So back Prior to 1990, uh, 
it was typical to have design heating loads in residential buildings anywhere from 25 to 40 BTUs per hour per square foot. Again, that's a design load, worst case day. Today, we're seeing houses uh, that are in the 10 to 15 BTUs per hour per square foot at design load conditions. So again, we're, we're reducing our design load down to a, roughly a third of what it was a few decades ago, All right? Uh, obviously, we've talked about it, strong interest in net zero, uh, where we're doing photovoltaic systems on the roof or on the ground, producing electricity, and certainly those situations uh, beg for use of a heat pump. So heat pumps are gonna become, uh, I guess I would say the new norm. And it's not that I'm against boilers. Boilers are gonna be there. In fact, I'm gonna try to build a case for using a boiler with a heat pump as we go through today. But heat pumps will continue to grow in as a percentage of the heat source market in, in hydronics. Uh, we've seen this, uh, for example, in Germany over the last three years, heat pumps have actually outsold fossil fuel boilers. And, and that is perhaps one of the strongest hydronics market in the world. Um, certainly consumer interest in topics like sustainability, resiliency, think back to what happened in Texas last winter when the polar vortex storm came through and basically wiped out the power grid, the sewer, the water and so forth. How could we potentially design systems that can get through a situation like that without you know, immediate failure? Uh, and I point out too that a hydronic system is going to last several decades. A, a properly designed, properly installed system has a long life to it. And today, as consumers were getting somewhat accustomed to appliances, for example, that might last seven years, maybe 10 years if you're lucky, uh, we've become more of a disposable society in terms of hardware. Hydronic systems are really uh, kind of the antithesis of that. It's a long lasting system. And at the point where it does have to be recycled, steel certainly and copper are both highly recyclable materials. Um, most consumers today, <clears throat> excuse me, expect cooling in their homes. Uh, they have it where they work, they have it in their car, they even have it in their in their farm tractors in some cases. So this has always been what I'd call a missing piece or kind of an Achilles heel in the hydronics market. Um, what do I do about cooling? I'm interested in hydronic heating, what do I do about cooling? That situation is changing and largely because we're bringing heat pumps in as our, our new norm in, in, in both heat sources, or I'll say heating and cooling sources. Now, radiant panel heating has been around for several decades. Uh, one of the things that happens when you do radiant panel heating in a very low load house is that the surface temperatures of those surfaces, they really don't have to warm up very much to meet the load. So we're looking at surface temperatures that uh, consider, for example, a heated floor. Uh, even on a design day, that surface might only get up to maybe 75 degrees Fahrenheit. So we may or may not uh, satisfy consumers' expectations. If they're thinking about really warm floors, uh, we're probably not going to satisfy their expectation because the floors simply don't have to get that warm. And we, we want to make sure consumers understand that that you know, we aren't promising them that you know, as all the ads uh, going back again, two or three decades in the radiant panel market, many of those ads showed the barefoot friendly floors and really pushed this idea that the floors would be noticeably warm. And I'm not saying the floors are going to be cool, but they're not gonna be as warm as they used to be. And we wanna make sure again, we communicate that. Um, internal heat gains are definitely gonna have more impact on structures that have much lower envelope losses. Uh, solar gains, for example, uh, could quickly overheat a space. How does our hydronic system respond to those situations? Do we have low thermal mass emitters? Do we have the ability for one room to reduce its heat output very quickly, whereas another room still needs heat? So room by room zoning is nice, uh, and low thermal mass emitters are also helpful in that respect. Um, certainly increased interest, uh, you know, I guess it goes without saying over the last couple of years with the COVID situation, there's a lot of interest in indoor air quality. So 
anything that improves indoor air quality tends to be looked at very favorably. And our hydronic systems, as we'll talk about today, we can extend those systems out to do uh, good air quality. Uh, we can incorporate, for example, heat recovery ventilation along with uh, space heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. And another thing, uh, for many years, um, many homeowners are not satisfied with the comfort that their homes provide. There's been various surveys over the years. I remember Honeywell in particular did one survey and uh, in round numbers, about two thirds of the people they surveyed indicated they were not satisfied with the comfort. So it's extremely important that as we look at the technology and how we design these systems, that we don't forget about comfort and selling comfort and extolling the virtues of superior comfort. It's not just about putting BTUs into a building, it's about providing a comfortable environment. So um, we're, we're gonna have a couple poll questions today. The first one here, approximately what percentage of your hydronic system projects go into low energy or net zero homes? And, and Max is gonna run that poll for us. So you should see that coming up now. We've got um, a bunch of people jumping in now. I'll give it about uh, 40 seconds or so, and then I'll close it and then read the results back to you. Mm -hmm. What's your What's your guess so far, Siggy, before I share the, the results? Well, um, Net Zero is, is new, so I'm guessing, uh, you know, it it's a market that has growth potential, but it's not a dominant market at this point. Uh, so I'm not expecting it will be a super high percentage, at, at least at this point in time. Okay, well, let me, I'm, that's been up for about 45 seconds. So I'm going to close this and share this. I don't know if you can see the city since you're the presenter. So we had 20% never, 53% seldom for 10 to 25%, uh, significantly for 26 to 50% was 18%. And then often was nine uh, percent, so okay. um, probably skewing a little bit bigger than than I had expected as well for yeah. a, a newer technology there. <clears throat> yeah, so roughly one in four would be uh, at this point, and I I suspect those numbers are definitely dependent on where they where the the people are within the market too. Yeah, yeah in particular, absolutely. What, state, what what regulations are under? Uh, interesting poll. Thanks, Max. Okay, so back to the comfort. Um, <clears throat> we're talking about providing comfort, not just matching BTU delivery to the load. Um, one of the things that I found looking at the net zero market and, and watching it over the last several years is that the ductless mini split heat pump seems to be kind of the default that many uh, proponents of net zero housing uh, houses go for. Okay, a common suggestion in a low load or net zero house, one or two, maybe three indoor wall cassettes and leave the doors open. And one of the, the websites that talks about this, Green Building Advisor, it's a pretty interesting website. Um, but here's a couple statements that they put in there regarding the use of ductless mini split heat pumps in these houses. Um, they point out realistically that if the bedroom doors are closed at night, and you're essentially you're isolating that room from where the ductless uh, indoor unit is, that the temperatures are going to go down maybe five degrees or so in a well insulated building. That's a compromise. If somebody is there is about keeping a uh, you know room at a specific temperature. Um, if the family doesn't want to abide by that, use supplemental electric resistance heating. So here we have a you know a new heat pump system, and we have somebody advising. Oh, by the way, you may want to buy some small electric uh, space heaters and put those in rooms uh, because if you close the doors at night and you want to keep it warm, you're going to need them. I, I don't really like that. I think that is certainly a compromise. Uh, it, it doesn't show that the that there is a solution to room by room comfort without some compromise. And one of the other things that's kind of been observed over the years when you look at performance on these units, many of the ductless mini split heat pumps will advertise sub zero degree Fahrenheit capacity control. They, they can hold capacity roughly down to about zero, maybe just a few degrees below zero. They do that by speeding up the compressor. 
the COPs really take a hit when you do that. So they don't really talk about it. You can, if you really do a lot of research, you can find some COP data for sub-zero degree Fahrenheit, but it's, it's certainly not the way, it's not a marketing point that they, they like to talk about. And um, one of the things I came across recently, an article in one of the uh, builder websites, Pro Trade Craft, uh, nine ways to hide a mini split. Uh, and I, I put a couple of them in there. You can build a grill in front of it. You can put it up above a closet, build a little recess for it. Um, you know, if if you're putting this system in and you're immediately thinking about from an architectural or an aesthetic standpoint, how do I hide this? You know, to me, again, why don't we look for a better solution? So indoor environmental quality. Uh, obviously, a lot of factors go into it. I, uh, I've listed them here. I don't want to take a lot of time to talk about them individually, but it is a lot more than just air temperature. Okay. Um, my friend there, Robert Bean up in Canada, he's got a super great website, uh, healthyheating.com. If you haven't taken a look at it, I really would point you there. Uh, Robert does a very deep dive into the human physiological comfort requirements and looking at the way the body releases heat that it produces by metabolism. So a large part of that is by thermal radiation exchange. So your body is radiating to cooler surfaces. And that has a major impact, uh, a more of an impact in fact than does air temperature. Okay, so why is it important? Well, many times people believe that air temperature, specifically air temperature on a thermostat, maybe four and a half, five feet above the floor, is the sole proxy for human thermal comfort. In other words, if the thermostat says a number, I'll pick a number, 71 degrees Fahrenheit, then I should be comfortable, regardless of the fact that if it's 62 degrees at the floor and 85 degrees at the ceiling, I still should be comfortable because the thermostat says it's 70 degrees. And I'm being a little sarcastic, but again, many consumers don't understand that it's more than just air temperature that affects comfort. In particular, warm surfaces in the winter are, um, are definitely going to improve human thermal comfort. So radiant panels or panel radiators, uh, as well as warmer surfaces that are just the result of less heat loss through the building envelope, okay? So again, it's something as purveyors of hydronics technology, we need to make sure people understand these differences. It is not a trivial decision uh, in regards to a, a long-term um, effect that we're creating in these buildings. So we make a decision in building a structure that is going to be there for the life of the building. And uh, it is going to affect the, the health and, and, and the mindset of people uh, for many years. So it's an important distinction. I have this concept I call BTUs in a box. And there's the box, it happens to look like a house. And if you look at that purely from a thermodynamic standpoint, as long as the BTUs that go into the box equal the BTUs that go out of the box, you've satisfied an equilibrium condition. And in theory, the air temperature in the box is going to stay constant under those conditions. So from a pure thermodynamic standpoint, it really doesn't matter how we put the BTUs in or for that matter, where they leak out. We're just looking at it simply as a, a balance between input and output. Well, comfort is not that simple. So, you know, BTUs delivered, uh, again, I'll, I'll kind of pick on the ductless mini splits a little bit. These boxes can put BTUs into a building um, in various ways, uh, except during defrost. Uh, if you've experienced these in the wintertime, uh, they have to defrost the outside coil. And when they go into defrost, they're actually taking heat out of the indoor space and using that space to, or using that heat to melt the frost off the outdoor unit. And you'll notice that. Um, so it's time to put your hoodie footies on like you see here. Here's a distinction. You know, it's it's hard to come up with images that convey comfort, but uh, I'm sure everyone on the webinar understands when they are comfortable. And as again, radiant heat from different uh, 
radiators or radiant panels can make a significant impact on that comfort. So we're selling comfort, we're not selling hardware. So how does hydronics fit into this? Well, I always like to talk about the differences between delivering heat with air versus delivering heat with water. Uh, at the top, you see a blower and some flex stuff, common way to deliver heat using air. Uh, in the foreground of that flex stuff, you'll see some copper pipes. And I'll say that those copper pipes could probably deliver as much heat, if not more, BTUs per hour than, than the ducting that you see behind it. So how can a, a much smaller conduit, like a copper pipe, deliver as much heat as a much larger conduit, okay? Well, it comes down to the physical properties of air versus water. And specifically, we look at a property called heat capacity. And it's a very simple idea. How many BTUs does it take to raise a cubic foot of a material one degree Fahrenheit? And for water, it, it takes 62.4. And for air, it only takes 18 thousandths of one BTU to raise a cubic foot of air one degree Fahrenheit. So if we look at the ratio of those two heat capacities, we can say that water, a given amount of water, given volume of water, is almost 3,500 times better than the same volume of air when it comes to absorbing heat. So we can send far less volume of water through a distribution system and still convey the same amount of heat as we would with a much higher volume of air. And just as a kind of a scale comparison, a 14 inch wide, eight inch tall duct operating under standard trunk duct sizing, like a thousand feet per minute velocity, uh, that would, the equivalent to that would be a three quarter inch tube working at a delta T of about 20 degrees Fahrenheit. And obviously from a structural standpoint, that tube is much less invasive to the structure. Uh, I should definitely put a note on here, uh, don't do this to a two by 12 floor joist because you're basically destroying the structural integrity. And yet I'm sure many of you have been in projects and seen what I affectionately call sawzall surgery to the structure just to shoehorn in a pipe, a large pipe or a um, perhaps a duct. Now, here's another comparison. I took a half inch PEX tube operating at a 20 degree temperature drop. Um, that, could, that could easily convey 12,000 BTUs per hour. And remember 12,000 BTUs per hour in a modern building, low energy building, that could be half of the design load, okay? Uh, for example, a 2,400 square foot house at 10 BTUs per square foot per hour would have a design load of 24,000 BTUs per hour. So this half inch tube is carrying half of the design heating load uh, to be equivalent to that, a nine inch round duct or a seven by 10 duct would be necessary, again, because of the heat capacity of water versus air. So we're simply dealing with a much better uh, material to absorb heat and use as a transport mechanism through the building. We don't have to build soffits around ducts. We don't have to wind the ducts around the cords up or the webbing up in the trusses and so forth. Much easier to attach small flexible tubing to the sides of joists or drill holes where we need to uh, compared to running that ducting. Uh, with renewables, there's a lot of reasons. I'll just turn all these on. Uh, why do I bring renewables into it? Because a heat pump is a renewable energy heat source. And you know, obviously there's others out there. There's biomass boilers, there's solar thermal collectors and so forth. But you'll find that hydronics technology is really the underlying the underlying nuts and bolts that allows many of these systems to work. And we, using hydronics technology, we can do things like thermal storage. We don't have to have a building full of refrigerant tubing and, and refrigerant. Uh, we can integrate the renewable heat source with conventional heat sources. Uh, it's very easy to do zoning. And now we can do heat metering. So we, we have a lot of design options, a lot of design flexibility available to us to incorporate renewable heat sources, heat pumps and others into systems that simply aren't there with other approaches. Now, another um, advantage of hydronics that I, I like to talk about is distribution efficiency. This is um, often what I call the untold story of, of hydronics. Oftentimes we get, uh, we get hung up on efficiencies of heat sources like 
a boiler that's 95% efficient or a heat pump that has a COP of, of three and a half or four. And we somewhat dismiss, where is the rest of the energy in the system going? How about the energy that it takes to move heat from where it's produced to where it's needed in the building? Well, we can easily define an efficiency that would uh, give us a metric for that. Distribution efficiency, simply the rate of heat delivery divided by the rate of energy use by the distribution equipment. It has nothing to do with the heat source. The heat source is completely irrelevant here, okay? So as a quick example, here's a hydronic system. It has four circulators. They're running at 85 watts a piece at design load. We're delivering 120,000 BTUs per hour. So we just do our ratio and we come up with this number, 353 BTUs per hour are being delivered per watt of electrical input to the distribution system, okay? So why is it important? Well, you know, if your overall goal is to design highly energy efficient systems, we have to not only be concerned about the source equipment, but also the other ancillary energy uses in the system, in particular that uh, energy it takes to move that heat along. So we calculated this number, 353 BTUs are delivered per hour for each watt of electrical input to the system. To judge whether it's good or bad, let me give you a quick comparison. Here's a standard furnace, 80,000 BTUs per hour. Uh, it has a blower in it with a permanent split capacitor motor that needs 850 watts when it's running. So look at our distribution efficiency here. It's uh, roughly about a quarter of what we had before. So in these two particular cases, the distribution efficiency advantage definitely goes to the hydronic system. And again, it simply goes back to water versus air, those fundamental thermodynamic properties of water versus air. And I, I wanna show you with modern design, we can do much better than a four to one ratio. And here's a good example. It's simply a buffer tank. It could be heated by anything. Uh, we're putting a small variable speed circulator on there. They're available from pretty much every circulator manufacturer today. We're going to a manifold station and we're putting in some half inch PEX home run circuits out to panel radiators. And I size those panel radiators around an average water temperature of 110 degrees. So we're, we're you know, you'll see the size of the radiator. It's a pretty good size radiator. It's two feet high, six feet long. Um, we could go smaller if we went to higher water temperatures, but I want to show a, a, an example that would be relevant to using a heat pump. And with a few calculations, you can determine how much wattage is necessary. And, and at that water temperature, how much heat are we delivering? Well, we're delivering um, 30,800 BTUs per hour on 8.6 watts of electrical input, okay? And there's an example of a radiator. That's a four foot wide unit, two foot tall. You see the two half inch tubes at the bottom and the thermostatic radiator valve here. Uh, here's just an example of one of the circulators that's out there right now. Uh, we've used uh, several of these, they're, they're pretty cool. They have Bluetooth communication, so you can take your phone and interrogate what the pump is doing. And uh, here's an example of distribution efficiency. If we're delivering 30,800 BTUs per hour on 8.6 watts, we're almost 3,600. BTUs per hour per watt. So we're way beyond what the forest air system was doing, okay? So again, that becomes part of the hydronic portfolio that we're offering. What's an air to water heat pump? Well, heat pumps come in different flavors. We've certainly talked about the ductless mini splits, uh, water to water heat pumps that are commonly used in geothermal systems. So what we're doing with an air to water is we're using air as a source. So it's you know the same source that we would use with an air to air heat pump, but we're using water as the delivery mechanism. Okay, and this is the newest flavor of heat pump in the North American market. Uh, quite honestly, um, I'm sure there are heating professionals that, that simply don't even know what an air to water heat pump is at this point, but it is a strong growing market. You're gonna see more and more product entry in, uh, in North America uh, this year and beyond. Uh, we did a whole issue of hydronics on air to water heat pumps, hydronics number 27. Uh, and as we're talking about, you can get this either as a PDF right off the website. Uh, if you register, you can get it mailed to you as a hard copy. 
but I'd have you check out the uh, digital version of it. There's some really nice links in there. So uh, if you want more information on air to water, heat pumps, this is the issue to check out. Now, in terms of hardware, there's basically two dominant configurations. There's what's called the monoblock configuration. Uh, the monoblock systems are factory charged. You set it outside, you bring the water pipes to it, you bring the electricity to it. There is no need to do anything with refrigerant. So um, a, a person that does not necessarily have the skills to deal with refrigerant can install install one of these. And you'll see there's several companies that offer these um, in the market. Some of these can actually operate down to temperatures uh, minus 15, minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit. They don't have a lot of heating capacity. And quite honestly, the COPs are not too good. There might be in a range of 1.5, 1.7 under those conditions, but that is still significantly better than electric resistance heat. Okay. Uh, there's an example of a monoblock heat pump set up uh, basically in a cold climate, with pretty much anywhere is in the United States or certainly in Canada. Uh, I would recommend you go with glycol in the entire system. You can set it up with a heat exchanger and just do a glycol loop between the heat, heat exchanger. Uh, we've done that. It works, but it does penalize the performance of the heat pump because it forces the heat pump to run at a higher temperature simply to have the delta T necessary to move the heat through the heat exchanger. Uh, it adds hardware to the system and so forth. Uh, certainly new construction, if you're working with a monoblock, I would say go with the you know, anywhere from a 25 to a 40% solution of propylene glycol in the entire system, okay? Now the other flavor of air to water heat pumps is a split system. You have the outdoor unit, the indoor unit, uh, which is about the size of a small ModCon boiler and then a refrigerant line set that connects those. So this does require some refrigeration, uh, basic refrigeration servicing skills, connecting the line set, doing the uh, uh, vacuum test on it uh, or pressure test with nitrogen, and then um, making sure that the uh, joints are tight. The nice thing about a split system is there's no water outside, so there's no need for antifreeze in the system. So both approaches have the pros and cons. Uh, both have similar COPs and capacities. And as I said, you're going to see multiple offerings for both configurations in the, uh, in the North American market. And real quick, and you can look at these uh, later on the PDF, over on the left, those are the existing offerings right now. Uh, over on the right, these are the companies that, uh, from what I've seen, look to be very interested in bringing product into the North American market. I'm sure you recognize some of the big players there. Mitsubishi is probably one of the biggest globally, but several companies uh, will likely have products, additional products on the market within, if not this year, by next year. Uh, Performance-wise, there's one summary concept that's really important. The lower you can keep the water temperature in your hydronic heating system, the better the performance of an air-to-water heat pump. So the heating capacity actually goes down as the water temperature goes up. You can see that over on the left there. And the COP is also affected in the same manner. So by designing our systems around low water temperatures, we're going to maximize performance on the heat pump. And this just goes back to, again, the thermodynamics of any heat pump. Uh, in theory, that COP is a function of the what we call the temperature lift from whatever the source material is, whether it's water or air, to whatever the sink material or the, the load material is. So the closer we can bring those two temperatures together, the better the performance of the heat pump is going to be. So be careful. You do not want to take the attitude that you can simply cut a boiler out of a system, especially a, an older system that might be operating at 160 or 180 degree Fahrenheit water and simply drop the heat pump in as a replacement for that boiler. Uh, you're going to have problems right from the moment you turn the switch on with that because the distribution system, if it was designed for those high water temperatures, simply won't be able to dissipate the heat that the heat pump is injecting at lower temperatures. And the heat pump will go into short cycles. So it's not, it's not good for the hardware to do that. 
Um, one of the things that I would really stress as you design around air to water heat pumps, or for that matter, water to water geothermal, if you're going to a hydronic system um, and you're controlling the heat pump based on the temperature in a buffer tank, uh, use outdoor reset control. Remember, if we design a heating system, so at design load, we need, as an example, 120 degree water, we're already going to need that for perhaps a few hours or two or three days in a typical winter. Under more typical conditions, we're going to need far lower temperatures. And if we allow our system to go back to those lower temperatures as it gets warmer outside, we're going to improve that performance of that air to water heat pump. Okay, so outdoor reset control, very simple, relatively inexpensive. I show an example of a a Techmark controller here. There's, I'm sure, several others on the market. This is not, you know, it's not very expensive to do this. Some of the newer air to water heat pumps actually have internal controls that are that are capable of doing outdoor reset control. Uh, some of the others don't, so it's, you have to know the product. And there's a typical reset curve going from at minus 10 outside, 120 degree water temperature, and it bottoms out at 80, uh, just to allow some temperature difference, even under, um, you know, those, um, I'll say early fall, late spring conditions. It's a damp day. It's only maybe 55 degrees outside. Let's just put a little trickle of heat into our building. Okay. And of course, these controls have adjustable differentials and slopes. We have a lot of flexibility in how we configure that reset curve. And as I mentioned, many of the, the newer products, uh, the controls have the capability of, of doing outdoor reset. Now, low water temperatures, you know, just all these modern heat sources, ModCon boilers, water to water heat pumps, solar thermal collectors, and air to water heat pumps. All of these benefit from operating at lower water temperatures. If you look at those individual efficiency curves, you'll see that. So the, the absolute trend has to be towards lower water temperatures. Uh, we did a whole issue on how to lower the water temperature in an existing hydronic system. I believe it's um, issue number 25 of hydronics. I, I have a slide on it. So what I suggest to people is to set up any type of new hydronic system so that it can deliver design heating load with water temperature, supply water temperature no higher than 120 degrees Fahrenheit, and where possible or practical, even lower. And so you're future-proofing your system. You might say, well, I'm going to use perhaps an oil-fired boiler that can produce well, well beyond 120 degree water. Yes, you, you, could, you could design for those high temperatures today, but think about where that system might be five years or 15 or 20 years in the future. Uh, who knows what the price of the fossil fuels will be, even if they'll be available. So by designing around these lower water temperatures, you're future-proofing your system. That is part of resilient design. Okay, sustainability. So uh, just some typical temperature ranges of different heat emitters. Uh, what I'm suggesting is basically stay over here on the left. Uh, you still have options here. Uh, one of the newer products that is out now, and you're going to see these get coming into the North American market. There are a couple manufacturers that have these products today, and I think you'll see more probably this year what's called the fan assisted panel radiator. They have some very small little micro fans built into them, very low power, uh, but substantial increase in heat output at lower water temperatures. These are designed to operate in the range of about 100 to maybe 105 degree water temperatures. Okay. Slab floor heating, uh, certainly an option. Uh, again, if you get the PDF of the slides, you can take a look at the sizing graphs here. Uh, the one thing I'll emphasize before I move on here, uh, you only get one shot at doing that under slab insulation correctly. Uh, minimum spec, two inches of extruded polystyrene, that's a nominal R10. Uh, you only get one shot at it, okay? So do it right. Make sure you have good underside insulation. And, you know, over the years, we've seen a lot of ads for floor heating, things like this. You know, the so-called uh, the baby on the floor or barefoot friendly floors and so forth. And it might lead some people to say, well, is it is that always should I always use radiant floor heating? And my answer would be no. 
um, use it where it's appropriate, but recognize that there are situations where it may not satisfy what a consumer is expecting. And just to put a few simple numbers on it, let's take a 20 or a 2000 square foot house, well insulated. Let's say it has a design load of 18,000 BTUs per hour. And let's assume that 90% of that 2000 square feet of floor has tubing in. So we have available floor area for heating of about 1800 square feet. And I just made those numbers work out. So we would get a design load of 10 BTUs per hour per square foot. Now, the average surface temperature of a floor to deliver a given rate of heat output per square foot, you can use this formula for it. And if we just plug our numbers in, if we assume to hold our room at 68 degrees, the floor surface temperature only has to be about 73 degrees. It only has to be five degrees above the room temperature. And that's on a design day. On a part load day, that five degrees would diminish. And the question is, have we promised somebody these barefoot friendly floors? Well, again, the floors will be slightly warmer than they would be with other types of primarily convective or forced air delivery systems, but they're not going to be that 85 degrees that you might've experienced you know, 30 or 40 years ago in buildings that had much higher lows. The floors simply can't get to that temperature without grossly overheating the space. So I'm not saying don't use floor heating, but make sure that the, the client understands, yes, we can do it, but the floors may not feel as warm as what you might have experienced in another building. Okay, don't, don't sell beyond what you're going to deliver. Uh, thermal mass. Uh, thermal mass varies a, over a wide range in hydronics. So what I did is I, I took these different heat emitter technologies and I calculated how much material in each technology would we need to deliver 1,000 BTUs per hour at a 110 degree average water temperature and maintain the room at 70 degrees. And if you look at the bar graph, you'll see a huge range of thermal mass here. Uh, obviously, the four inch slab is uh, much higher than the others. And over on the far right there, the, the panel radiator and especially the low mass uh, fan assisted panel radiators, uh, the, that low mass radiator has about one one hundredth of the thermal mass of that four inch concrete slab. So in terms of response time, uh, the fan radiator is definitely going to respond a lot faster. Uh, and that's important, especially if your structure is going to experience, um, let's say, unscheduled internal heat gains, things like sunlight or uh, crowds of people or equipment or you know anything that generates heat. Uh, can quickly overheat a very well insulated space and having a low mass heat emitter allows that rapid response so that we don't get into uh, big temperature overshoots. Okay? So in general, I would recommend a lower mass heat emitter system in a low energy use building. Here's an example one. This is kind of a, I'll say low to medium thermal mass system. Uh, this is radiant ceilings. Um, they're uh, they work well in heating. Uh, they shine thermal radiation down on whatever is below them. Um, and they're excellent for cooling. Uh, but if you're going to do cooling with a ceiling like this, uh, you have to make sure you do not go below the dew point temperature with the chilled water. That's a whole other subject. We have addressed that in uh, some of the previous issues of hydronics. But this type of a system, <clears throat> uses readily available materials, that's PEX aluminum, PEX tubing, and aluminum plates. And uh, the output, uh, if we take 110 degree water in a 70 degree room, that's a 40 degree temperature difference times 0.7. Round numbers, it's about 28 BTUs per hour per square foot. So what does that imply to a building that might only need 10 BTUs per hour per square foot at design? Well, it implies that you would need one square foot of heated ceiling per 2.8 square feet of floor area. So you don't necessarily have to heat the whole ceiling. That thermal image you're looking at, that's only a six foot wide flat ceiling. And the floor area below it is 14 feet wide. And that ceiling can easily heat that space. So 
Um, that is an option. Take the same construction, put it on a wall. You actually get a little bit more heat output here because you get a little more convection on a vertical surface compared to that ceiling. Uh, with 110 degree water in a 70 degree room, you'd have about 32 BTUs per square foot uh, per hour output. So again, uh, a four foot high wall could potentially heat a, a you know a, a room. You'd have to do the math on it, but a, a room that might be 15 or 16 feet wide. Um, you can see here before I leave it, if you look at the thermal image, uh, very important to have those aluminum plates in there. Uh, I had people say, well, you can save money if you don't buy the aluminum plates and just put the tubing in the wall. And that's true. Well, I used to, uh, my uh, degree is actually back in aeronautical engineering. And I would tell people, you can definitely save price on an airplane if you simply leave the left wing off. So think about that. You've got to do it right. And those plates are very important to diffuse that heat across that surface and get that output that we're expecting here. Uh, one of my favorite heat emitters is panel radiators. Uh, several manufacturers offer these in North America. Uh, fast response, you can get them in a variety of widths and depths and heights. Uh, just half inch tubing, supply and return to each one. And uh, a thermostatic radiator valve. And now you've got room by room zoning. Uh, I want to show you these four images down at the bottom. I used a, a thermal camera over a period of about four minutes just to show what happens to the surface temperature on these panels as we open a valve on a radiator that previously had been shut off. And you get some really interesting effects there. You can see that warm water spreading out across the upper header and then moving its way down through the channels on the front of the radiator. And within about four minutes, you're, you're closing in on a steady state condition. So again, fast response, Simple, these hang on wall brackets. Uh, you do, uh, again, half inch pecs or half inch pecs, aluminum pecs. Uh, I really like these. Uh, they're excellent in retrofit situations, but uh, as I say, one of my favorites in, in new construction as well. Um, now, again, uh, we talk about um, low temperature performance of panel radiators in this current issue of Hydronics number 30, uh, adjusting the performance, the output numbers that manufacturers would provide typically at higher water temperatures, how do you adjust that for lower temperature operation? The bottom line is the panel gets significantly larger at lower water temperatures, uh, but that is necessary to get the water temperatures that you need to operate, especially trying to get good performance out of a heat uh, pump. Um, just an example of one of the fan assisted panel radiators. They actually have a little circuit board built into them. Um, they, uh, they use these fans to enhance the convection output at low water temperatures. Uh, again, watch the market. I think you will see some new entries into the market uh, in North America this year. Okay, what about retrofitting uh, existing systems uh, in buildings that are transitioning to electric HVAC? The market is moving towards electricity. How do we deal with that from a retro, uh, retrofitting standpoint? So I, I've got a couple of questions here to ask, a, a rational path towards electrification. Can the utility grids handle rapid and extensive shift from all fossil fuels to electricity? Um, this is something that politicians don't necessarily look at in great detail, uh, but engineers should be looking at this and, and need to. Um, you know, as we put more and more emphasis on electricity, obviously we've got to not only generate that electricity, but we've got to move it around. And another question, should all existing hydronic heat sources operating on fossil fuel be immediately scrapped and replaced by a heat pump? Uh, there are people that would say yes to that question. Um, I, I would say no. I would say let's use the, the fossil fuel uh, source at least over its remaining service life as a way to transition into what will eventually become dominant electrification of our HVAC systems. Okay, and just to show you one of the things that's going on uh, in New York State, uh, one of the studies that was recently done looked at what's the impact of electrification on peak demand. 
And New York State has for years been traditionally a summer peaking utility based on air conditioning load. Well, in about 10 years, the projection is we will change to a winter peaking situation. And you can see there that that winter peak continues to go up as we go into maybe the next 20, 25 years into the future. And this is going to require modification of major transmission lines, perhaps addition and so forth. So uh, again, I, I, from an engineering standpoint, look at this and say, we shouldn't necessarily immediately throw out fossil fuel equipment. Let's use it as a transitional technology. And it makes sense to do that, okay? Don't write off new or existing boilers in combination with air to water heat pumps. Here's four important points. We're going to need supplemental heat during extreme cold weather. Uh, where I live, it's been to minus 15, about five or six nights uh, in uh, this year alone. Uh, those air to air or air to water heat pumps, they're still running, but they're at very low capacity. And of course, your building loads are peaking out at that point. So if we have an existing fossil fuel boiler, we have a supplemental heat source. And we also have one that's capable of a full backup, assuming it was sized to handle the design heating load of the building when it was installed. It can not only supplement the output of the heat pump, but it, it could serve as an entire backup system if the heat pump was down for servicing. And here's another important point. We can run a small you know, oil burner or gas fired boiler and maybe a couple circulators. We can run that on 400 watts of power from a small portable electric generator. A heat pump or certainly an electric resistance boiler is going to need several thousand watts of electrical power. It's, it's available. You could do a whole house generator at maybe 15 to 20 kW. Uh, obviously, that adds quite a bit of cost to uh, keep that going. So there's a resiliency aspect to a fossil fuel system simply because it can be run from a very small generator in a uh, power outage or a very um, strong storm condition. Um, <clears throat> And again, one of the other issues here is that your peak tool or your supplemental device is not adding substantially to the peak electric load on the utility. So you have a, a non-electric backup and supplemental heat source. Remember, you may be getting 90, even 95% of the total space heating energy from the heat pump. So you're, you're not using a lot of fossil fuel but under conditions where we need it, we have that capacity available. And we're, you know, again, we're, we're shifting the vast majority of the energy use to electricity, but we're not, in a sense, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, especially in an existing retrofit. Very easy, you basically set the heat pump up in parallel with the boiler. If you're going to a low temperature system, uh, and you have a, con uh, a conventional boiler, a cast iron boiler, a steel fire tube boiler, you probably want to put an anti-condensation mixing valve in to make sure that that boiler uh, that has been used to operating well above the dew point of the flue gases. Uh, if you're, again, if you're going to operate that at lower water temperatures, uh, you don't want sustained flue gas condensation in the boiler. So standard uh, practice would be to put an anti-condensation mixing valve in to do that. So Max, we're, now, we're to another poll question here. Um, and I'll read it. Um, do you or would you work with systems that combine a heat pump with either a new or an existing boiler? Let's just see what our um, attitudes are on that. Okay, so I've got the launch and um, we've got a pretty pretty big uh, um, difference in the answers here. So I'll give that a couple more seconds. Um, but I think that this is, uh, I think we've got a good audience here to kind of understand the, the landscape. Okay, let me go ahead and close that. Okay, so the results are 89% uh, said yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So vast majority understand uh, that you can use these two heat sources together. And again, I understand some of the respondents may be in areas where the fossil fuel option is 
is either gone or soon will be gone. So that's understandable that that may not even be an option to them. Okay, let's go back. Now, existing hydronic systems uh, are often designed around these high water temperatures. A good example is a series baseboard system. Uh, it could be designed anywhere from 160 to 200 degree water, okay? Um, but an important thing to understand here, we are not at design load all the time. In fact, we're at design load the vast minority of the minutes in the heating season or the hours in the heating season. And just to show that, I'm showing what are called bin temperature data uh, for upstate New York, Syracuse. And over on the left of the graph here, you can see, yeah, it can get to minus 20 in Syracuse. And on an average, that might only occur one hour, maybe two hours in a year, if it does at all. Um, and then as we get to slightly warmer temperatures up around zero, you can see a few hours are starting to build in here. But look at the hours from perhaps 20 to 40 or 50 degrees. You get in the mid part of this graph. This is the vast majority of hours in a heating season. And of course, the graph will vary from one location to another, but the, the trending is the same. We spend much more time under part load conditions than we do under design load. And we wanna recognize that and uh, design our systems so that the heat pump is basically going to be performing better under those conditions. And if we need supplemental heat under those very cold conditions, we'll use it, okay? Um, I'm gonna show you something in a minute here uh, where we've actually done a study. And what we found is that an air to water heat pump retrofit into a high temperature distribution system in uh, upstate New York climate can still su supply without modification to that distribution system. And under these partial load conditions, it can supply about 75% of the total seasonal energy, okay? That, that might sound high, but it really recognizes those hours that you see in that red rectangle over on the right side there, all right? And here's the software. I uh, developed this with my software partner, Mario uh, Restive. I believe Mario's in. Uh, on the webinar today. And uh, this is something, it's a project we're doing for NYSERDA. Uh, we've really built some pretty detailed models for the heat pump performance, uh, the building heating characteristic. Uh, we're looking at things like defrost on the air to water heat pumps. And we've built in a pretty, um, pretty detailed financial analysis. Uh, this is gonna be used by NYSERDA to do a study. Uh, what our long-term hope is that is that NYSERDA will eventually recognize that air to water heat pumps should be in the portfolio of heat pump offerings along with geothermal as well as air to air heat pumps as, as part of the goal in, in moving towards this electrification target. Uh, this is not something we can release at this point. I simply wanna show it to you as a uh, some, somewhat of a proof that we are working on this and we're, we're getting models that are showing some pretty good performance. You can see uh, we're actually under this scenario, we're showing a seasonal COP on this air to water system at just over three, about 3.1. So we're getting into the territory of where a geothermal heat pump could be. I'm not necessarily gonna say that we're gonna beat a geothermal heat pump, but uh, from a return on investment standpoint, we're, we're coming into the market at substantially lower cost and simpler installation. Um, now, I mentioned we did a issue of hydronics on lowering water temperature in existing systems. In real quick summary, there's a couple things you can do. Uh, you can either improve the building envelope, which brings the load down, or you can add heat emitters to the system. The more heat emitter surface area you have, the lower the water temperature can be. And there are calculations to, um, yeah, fairly simple calculations that you can make to determine, uh, for example, if I brought the load from 100,000 to 70,000, how much could I lower the water temperature, okay? Uh, basically, what you wanna do is, let me go back up here. Uh, typically, you're gonna run into series loop systems or sometimes what's called a split series loop. And basically, what you're gonna do if you're modifying the system by adding heat emitters, is converted to a parallel system. Well, kind of a hybrid. 
it's not completely parallel because some of the existing series baseboards are going to remain in series. But we're cutting up that distribution system and we're using PEX or PEX aluminum PEX as a much easier piping option to basically take segments of that existing system and convert them into parallel branches. And we can bring in thermostatic radiator valves. For example, we can use a product like this that has a, a valve with a capillary tube running up to a wall dial. Uh, so we could adjust that wall dial just like a thermostat. Uh, we can use a combination of a thermostatic operator that's screwed onto a uh, valve. Or we might be using panel radiators that have an integral valve and we're just adding the thermal operator to it. So we have a lot of potential um, variations on the hardware and, and how we can uh, control that system. And while we're doing it, we can go into um, combined air, dirt, hydraulic, and magnetic particle separation with a, a SEP4 separator. And we can also go over to a variable speed circulator. So we're really modernizing the system hydraulically and thermally uh, as we bring that water temperature down to regions where the heat pump can perform well. Um, again, I, I don't want to spend too much time on it. Uh, if you get a copy of Hydronix 25 or, or simply go to the Hydronix website, Kalefi website, uh, that has the calculations. It has quite a few more diagrams in it to show you how to bring those water temperatures down. <clears throat> okay, I mentioned earlier systems that do space heating, cooling, and domestic hot water. So here's where the mindset is with a lot of people today. It's natural to think that using an air source heat pump for space heating, along with a heat pump water heater for domestic water is a good solution. You know, I've got a heat pump for heating, I've got another heat pump for domestic water. All right, so maybe it's something like this, a multi-head uh, ductless mini split that's doing the space heating. And we're gonna throw in one of these, a uh, heat pump water heater. Well, this isn't necessarily an optimal combination, all right? And it's kind of interesting. Um, this question came up several months ago. So I started to look at this from a thermodynamic standpoint. And here we've got essentially two heat pumps in series. One heat pump is bringing heat from outside air and putting it into the building space, the internal space. The other heat pump, the water heater, is taking some of that heat and putting it into the water. And these two heat pumps could operate at, at two different COPs, coefficients of performance. Well, if you work through the, again, the, the mathematics of putting heat pumps in, essentially in series like this, you can come up with what I call a, a net COP. And it looks like kind of an ugly formula there with a lot of COPs in it, but it's actually a pretty simple calculation. Um, and just as an example, let's say that we've got the space heating heat pump operating at a COP of four, so it's, it's doing well, and the water heater is operating at a COP of three. So you think, gosh, we have COP of four on the space heating, we have a COP of three on the domestic water, we must have, you know, maybe even a 3.5 on the uh, net. Well, put the numbers into the formula. You're netting out at about a 2.0. And this is simply the, I guess I'd call it the thermodynamic uh, reality of putting heat pumps in sequence like this. Um, now, if some of the heat inside the building is coming from solar gain or some other type of heat essentially that you're not paying for, that will bring the, CO, the net COP up. But if you're looking at a building where the vast majority of the internal heat came from a heat pump uh, drawing its heat from the outside air. Uh, you can see that actually an air to water heat pump would do better uh, on a domestic hot water load as one of its loads, not, not solely for domestic water, but on, as one of its loads. You'll actually do better with an air to water heat pump than you will with this combination of an air to air heat pump and a heat pump water heater. Uh, again, Hydronics number 30 has some more discussion of this. So I wanted to just show you a uh, uh, system for doing this. Uh, it's very similar to the system we looked at at the beginning here. 
We've got a monoblock heat pump that's coming into a diverter valve. Uh, in heating, we're basically going to send heat to that buffer tank. Uh, inside the buffer tank are coils that will do preheating on domestic water. Uh, the cold domestic water makes a single pass through those coils, and then it goes into some kind of supplemental electric heater. It could be a tank or a tankless type heater. We've got panel rads over here for heating distribution. Um, we've got an electric boiler as a supplemental device or as a backup if the heat pump is down. And then down at the bottom, we've got a single air handler for cooling. Uh, in the summer, the diverter valve would simply send the heat pump output, the chilled water through the coil in the air handler. And then you notice we're not using the buffer tank during, we're not chilling the buffer tank. Uh, and we're doing this because we have a, uh, an inverter type heat pump. The heat pump can control the speed of its compressor so that we maintain a preset output temperature, 45 to 50 degree Fahrenheit chill water temperature would be typical. So uh, during the space heating season, we're gonna maintain the buffer tank based on outdoor reset control. During what I call the non-heating season, uh, this could be late spring, early fall, we're gonna let that heat pump take that tank up to a higher temperature. It's warm outside, relatively speaking. It's 50, 60, 70 degrees outside. And under those conditions, that heat pump is gonna do well in terms of COP, even bringing that water temperature up to 120, 130 degrees Fahrenheit. That would probably eliminate most, if not all of the electric resistance supplemental heat, okay? And then during cooling, uh, a call for cooling takes priority. In other words, during a, a thermostat call for cooling, we're going to operate the air handler. The buffer tank is not going to get heat. I, I'm sorry, during, I got it backwards. During a call for cooling, the buffer tank takes the priority because we want to make sure we're delivering domestic hot water. So we can switch from cooling over to heating. Remember, it's only going to take typically five to 10 minutes for that heat pump to bring that buffer tank back up to temperature, depending on what the rise is. So we're not, we're not interrupting cooling for a long period of time. And quite honestly, we could leave the blower in the air handler running during that time and simply stop the chill water flow. And then once we satisfy the domestic uh, or the buffer tank temperature, we switch immediately back over to cooling, okay? So, um, some heat pumps that are on the market now actually do this. They have internal controls that can coordinate this operation. They allow you to either set uh, cooling as a priority load over domestic water or vice versa. And I've, again, we can do that with uh, separate controls, but as heat pumps evolve, uh, I think you're gonna see that control functionality integrated right into the firmware of the heat pump. Now, another question that comes up, what about ventilation? Obviously, in these tighter thermal envelopes, we need ventilation. So let's add a heat recovery ventilator or an energy recovery ventilator to the system. Uh, again, these are widely used in low energy and net zero houses. I believe they're required by code in Canada on all new residential construction. So if we incorporate a, a air handler and we do a ducting system for cooling, we can incorporate an HRV and tie it right into that duct system. And we can do some interesting things. For example, in a ventilation only mode, we can run the blower in the air handler at a very low speed. That would be comparable to what the airflow from the uh, HRV is. We don't need to run that at our full cooling capacity airflow if we're just doing ventilation. But once we switch to cooling mode, uh, we can ramp the speed right back up. And I've actually talked to at least one manufacturer and they have no problem. They can set up the uh, uh, controls on an ECM blower motor to vary that speed over quite a wide range. Another thing we can do with this air handler is uh, as you see down at the bottom here, let's assume it's really cold outside. So we're coming in with, let's say minus 10 degree air uh, we are recovering heat, but even if we recover about 70% of our heat, we're still putting 46 degree air into the backside of that air handle. And that could be perceived as cool air going into the house. So we could set up some type of a modulating valve that would take warmth from our buffer tank and send it through that coil and use that simply to bring that air up to some temperature that's more comfortable. 
Now, again, we're not trying to do space heating with the air handler. We're simply trying to boost that cold 46 degree air up to maybe 70 degrees and then send it in at a basically a neutral temperature into the space. So again, that's, that's a nice little detail that you can incorporate. Um, down here in the lower right, I showed how you could do that using a thermostatic valve. Um, simply, it has a temperature sensor in the discharge duct. You would set the valve for what temperature you want. And when the system operates in that mode and you have warm water coming from the buffer tank, that valve simply modulates to control that um, discharge air temperature. So again, we're, we're bringing ventilation into the offering for the contractor. So we've got space heating, cooling, domestic hot water, and heat recovery ventilation potential. And here's the overall system. I just took the same system and added a heat recovery ventilator down there to the air handle. Okay, so it's a total solution that you can offer for a low energy or net zero project. Single source, one company does all the work and is responsible for the service. Uh, again, air handler can be programmed for quite a wide range of speed control, uh, maybe 100 to 150 CFM ventilation only mode, right up to 400 CFM per ton for cooling. So interesting combination here. Real quick, I wanna run through some example systems. Uh, I'd recommend you download the PDF and study these in a little more detail. Uh, here's a monoblock system. Remember, monoblock factory charge refrigeration. So we're going to operate this whole system with antifreeze. Uh, the monoblock heats the buffer tank. There's coils in the buffer tank that do domestic water preheating. We do a final temperature boost when necessary with a tankless water heater, and we make sure we put a, uh, a point of distribution, uh, a thermostatic mixing valve in. So uh, you know, we don't send overly heated water out to the fixtures. And space heating is as simple as a manifold, half inch PEX or other types of tubing running out to panel radiators, okay? Pretty simple system that provides space heating and domestic water, no cooling built into this, okay? Uh, let's see, now we're adding single zone cooling and another method of domestic water heating. So we've got a single zone air handler that takes the chill water from the monoblock heat pump in, uh, in summer. Uh, the buffer tank in this case does not have internal coils. We're using an external brace plate heat exchanger as our means of moving heat from the buffer tank to the domestic water. Uh, that's operating uh, with a circulator and a small flow switch. Uh, that concept is used a lot in the European market. We don't see it as much in North America, but We've tried it, it works. Um, it's, uh, again, it's an option. I tend to like it because the heat exchanger is completely replaceable if ne necessary. And you can install some valves so you can do a, uh, a mild acid flush of the domestic water side. You know, uh, I've had people say that um, a brace plate heat exchanger like this can scale up if you have hard water. And they're right. Uh, so can the coils in an indirect tank. If you've got hard water, there's no heat exchanger technology that I'm aware of that's immune to scaling. You need to treat the water. So uh, that is an option. And then over on the far right, I'm simply showing we could combine some radiant panel circuits, either floor, wall, or ceiling panels, uh, along with panel radiators, and use the thermostatic valves that have the capillary tubes going up to a remote setting dial. Uh, we actually did this on a house that I uh, helped design for my daughter a couple of years ago, and uh, it works great. Uh, so that way, there's no electric thermostats in the system as far as uh, space heating. You do have a thermostat that is used just for cooling on the air handler, uh, and then a variable speed circulator that simply ramps up and down as it needs to as those thermostatic valves open and close. Okay, so again, I, um, I put a few points down here for reference if you go back and read the PDF. Uh, here is a very, it's basically the same system with a split system heat pump. And instead of the tankless water heater, I'm showing a small tank type electric water heater as our final temperature boost. Uh, again, taking the preheated water coming off the stainless steel external heat exchanger and then the home run distribution system, okay. 
Uh, here's where we're either adding a fossil fuel boiler or as it says here, retaining an existing fossil fuel boiler. And you'll see it's piped in parallel with the, in this case, the monoblock heat pump. We have installed the anti-condensation valve because we're gonna run the system at low water temperatures. Uh, we're using a tank that has the internal coils for the domestic water preheat. And again, panel radiators for the distribution system. Okay, uh, here's a really simple system. Imagine you're doing a slab on grade building. Uh, it might be a fire station or uh, something along those lines. Uh, you don't necessarily need a buffer tank. Um, because you have a lot of mass out in that floor. Uh, I would recommend a hydraulic separator between the heat pump and the floor. That way you could do constant circulation in the floor circuits and simply turn the heat pump on and off and inject heat into that constantly circulating distribution system. And you can see it's a simple system, very simple. Um, and, you know, it would have a lower cost because we don't, we don't need the buffer tank. Okay, final thought. So let's put all these together and hopefully we'll have a couple minutes here for some questions. So we've talked about what's happening with building envelopes, uh, certainly codes and loads are, are uh, making major changes there. So we wanna recognize that. We wanna bring modern hydronics technology into this picture. We wanna adapt it to what's happening with the building envelopes. And we've got a lot of state-of-the-art hardware to do that. And we're certainly going to bring heat pumps, not only air to water, but geothermal water to water heat pumps into the picture as well. So we're, we're putting together these elements. And what are we getting? We're getting energy savings. We're getting superior comfort. And we're getting the carbon reduction. We're moving towards the ultimate goal of the electrification efforts that are underway, reducing carbon content. So I think that's a winning formula. And I think it is where the hydronics market is going to be, is moving in that direction rapidly at this point. Uh, I think it's a very sellable concept that we need to be talking about with our uh, potential clients. So with that, I want to, again, point you back to hydronics number 30 for some more details uh, that we didn't necessarily have all the time for today. And I also want to announce something that is happening in a couple months from now. And that is the fourth edition of my textbook, uh, Modern Hydronic Heating. And we've actually added a word to the title. It's Modern Hydronic Heating and Cooling. Uh, we've expanded this book out now to look at what we've talked about today, as well as other advances. Uh, the previous edition was written about 10 years ago. A lot has changed. Uh, we've added a whole chapter on hydronic cooling and um, just finishing up the final proofs on that. It's going to the printer next month and it should be available probably through any major bookseller um, in April. So with that, Max, do we have any, uh, any uh, submitted questions? We have a bunch of questions. So a few of them are probably more case specific um, that we can follow up with after the webinar. Some basic questions that we had. If you're looking for a PDF of the uh, presentation, as soon as the webinar ends, there'll be a little box that you can click that says, yes, I'd like a copy and they'll send that to you. This will also be on uh, YouTube next week if you wanna come back and refer to it. Um, one of the questions that we got that comes up a lot, I think when we talk about hydronics and, and radiance specifically, uh, was about comfort um, and defining what comfort is and isn't has always been a really tricky thing. But I'm going to put a link in the chat to this tool that I really like. It's called the uh, Center for the Built Environment uh, Thermal Comfort Tool based on ASHRAE 55. Um, and what you can do is go in and put in your own variables for air temperature, mean radiant temperature, airspeed, humidity, basically what the people are doing in the space. Are they typing or is it a, you know, are they running in gym or something like that and clothing level? Uh, and you'll see in a little graph that it, it um, updates live as you do it. Uh, if you are in the boundaries of ASHRAE 55-2020, uh, uh, which is really helpful, I think, for designing these systems. And it gives you a little bit more confidence that if you lowered the air temperature but increased the mean radiant temperature uh, with hydronics, that it's still you know going to be in a, a great spot for comfort and helps you put some numbers to that. Um, some of the other questions that we've got here, and Cody can jump into if he wants because he was monitoring the the questions. 
Um, so a lot of them are, one of the questions is about, uh, you know, maybe some sort of compromise with a gas powered heat pump too. They don't seem to be as prevalent as the, the air to water heat pumps, uh, but a natural gas heat pump could also be on the table for some of these markets too, if it's not a full, um, you know, carbon ban, but would be another way in a, a really cold climate to keep up. Have you seen any, uh, any research on that, Siggy? Well, not so much research. Uh, I know there is at least one manufacturer that has product on North American market, and we've looked at air to water versions of gas fired absorption heat pumps. And <clears throat> in summary, they, they give you the net effect that would be equivalent to burning natural gas at about 130% efficiency. So, yes, they do uh, offer more uh, output per unit of gas input. Um, honestly, I don't know where that market's going to go. It, it obviously, uh, it counts on natural gas or propane, uh, both of which I think are in the crosshairs as, as we go forward with the electrification. Uh, but the technology is there, it does work. Um, so it is, it is viable. Um, Max, you know, one of the things I do want to address real quick, and this is with questions too, uh, we do have several pre-submitted questions. And sure. at least a couple of them I mentioned that they uh, they live in climates where the temperatures can go down to like minus 20. Uh, again, that's where either a, an existing fossil fuel boiler or a new boiler or an electric boiler, assuming you have the service entrance capacity to operate it, uh, you need to have supplemental heat. I, I, I do get nervous about any type of heat pump, whether it's geothermal or air to water, as the sole means of heating the building, uh, simply because, uh, especially with the air to water, when you do get really cold temperatures, the capacity, the capacity just isn't there to meet the load. Uh, so you know you need some other supplemental input. And somebody would say, well, what if I put a wood stove in? Well, yeah, that could work. Uh, but in most cases, uh, you know, many people are looking for fully automated systems. So either a boiler or an, you know, a fossil fuel boiler or an electric boiler is, uh, is something we would design into the system. Another option would be electric elements in a tank. Uh, there are some buffer tanks available that have heating elements built in, which would simply you know, replace the need to have an external electric boiler. So uh, Max, back to you if you've got any other questions. And I'll say a bunch of the questions were uh, somewhat related to that cold temperature um, topic in general, um, you know, like would oversizing an air to water heat pump compensate for a colder temperature? Um, I think the answer is no, but if you want to address that one as well. Well, if you oversize the heat pump, uh, you will basically shift the temperature, uh, what's called the balance point temperature. And that would be the temperature at which the output of the heat pump exactly matches the load. So as you increase the size of the air to water heat pump relative to the load you're shifting that to lower and lower temperatures and the question really comes down to uh yes i can do that can i do it into the sub zero degree fahrenheit range uh i'll say yes but it's going to be very expensive to do that uh i don't think the return on investment would you know as an example let's say that your heat pump has half of the design load capacity when it's zero outside. If I just put two of them in, then in theory, I have enough capacity, but it may be much less expensive in, in terms of not only installation, but life cycle operating costs to just simply put an electric boiler or some other supplemental system in at, at a fraction of what that second heat pump would cost uh, it, you know, to handle those few hours when it's really cold outside. Yeah, I'll jump in here, John, too. I mean, yeah, I, what, there were a lot of questions about efficiency as far as lower temperatures and things like that. And and I, whenever we used to do geothermal, when I was in the field, it was the same way. It was like this cost to benefit ratio of, of yeah, we could get a geo system that could handle the load all the way down to a design day. But that would mean putting in another loop or two or something to that effect and and versus the very minimal cost of electric backup uh, to handle those few days a year. Like you said, it, it, sometimes the math just doesn't add up, you know, so. Right, right. 
Yeah, there were a lot of good questions in here, guys. Uh, I don't, I think we could go on for hours um, with that in mind. But uh, Max, did you see any more that you wanted to, to jump in on? Um, I think that that's probably the the low hanging questions. Um, one of the the last ones to come in was human comfort uh, related to humidification control, and absolutely that's a, a piece of it. Um, and I think that that's addressed, you know, with the uh, a ventilation strategy in a, a commercial building like a DOAS system would be a good pair for a lot of these hydronic systems that we're talking about that does directly address the uh, humidity side of the equation. Um, yeah, other than that, I think that we should probably go through the last few slides and then uh, follow up with some of the more specific questions um, after the fact. So. Uh, this is our team. If you call Kalefi, uh, this will be the, the group that answers the phone. Um, you can also uh, email questions to techsupport.us at kalefi.com. So uh, on our tech support line, you'll probably talk to either Greg or Dan in the pictures there from left to right. Uh, they also do our podcasts. So this is a great one if you are in the car, going somewhere between job sites or whatever the case may be to go through some topics in you know, about a half an hour that are right from the tech support line. So they're always really helpful tips to uh, make sure that your time out in the, the field is effective and you're uh, understanding kind of the full concept there. Uh, similar, five things you need to know by Cody. Uh, this is a YouTube series that we do. I think this is probably best suited for uh, like a wholesale market or something like that, wholesale house where you may not have a full hour at lunch, but you've got five minutes to learn more about mixing valves or uh, research creep or something like that. It's really a, a smaller version of what we do with Coffee with Kalefi and it's a great series. And then uh, follow us on social media. Uh, we see more and more uh, kind of engagement, I guess, on Instagram with people asking us questions there and uh, tagging us with job sites that they're proud of and, and we love to see that and we try and respond to those uh, as well so follow us there to see what we're up to next and that's it so thanks again siggy for going through the uh presentation today i think this is just a, a very big picture important conversation to have uh, and i think that if we don't have some concrete ideas for how we would do it uh, hydronics is going to get left behind for uh, a technology that may not be nearly as comfortable or as efficient, which would be a shame because we kind of already know how to do it. <laughs> and uh, I think this was a, a great tour through you know, how we can execute these systems and, and make sure that we're still you know, hitting all of the, the things that we do really well with hydronics as we shift in some cases to a different heat source, depending on regulations or things like that. So. Thank you again, Siggy. And uh, yeah, in the chat, I put the link to Hydronics 30 so you can see the, the digital version of what we were talking about today. Thanks for having me. Thanks, John. All right, thanks, Siggy. Bye.